Okay. Um, yeah, may I have your attention? Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, we, are, we are here with Kuna, and she will talk about um, Python and the Tor, the Tor project. Yes. Kuna, the show is yours. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. How do you like the weather so far? Yeah, it, is, it is pretty warm. Uh, thank you for coming, and thanks to the organizers for, for having me. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about Tor, the Tor project, what it is, what we do, and the Python projects that we have. So I am uh, from Norway. Sorry? The volume is actually max. I'll try to speak louder, so feel free to just shout a bit if I'm talking to. Is it better now? If I try to speak up a bit? OK. So I'm from Norway, uh, based in London. Uh, I do a lot of different things for Tor. Uh, Tor is a very flat organization in the sense that anything you want to do, you can just give it a try. You can take on any type of role that you want to have. So I am a developer. I do research. I am a project coordinator. I do community management. Uh, I'm also a support assistant, translation coordinator, so anything and everything, basically. Um, I also do some work related to uh, blocking analysis, um, censorship events around the world. Um, yeah. So I got involved in, uh, with Tor in 2009 during Google's sum Summer of Code, and I was volunteered uh, and been full-time for a year. Like I said, this is a presentation about Tor and the Tor project, uh, an introduction to some of the Python projects that we have. Not all are actually maintained, so I'll list some of them, and then there's like a long list on our website as well. And there's also some info about how you can get involved if you want to help us out. We really need more Python coders that can come and help us out with either documentation, coding, testing, anything and everything. So the Tor Project Inc. is a 501c3. It's a US nonprofit. Uh, Tor has been around since about 2002, when the Tor Project Inc. was founded in 2006. So it's been around for a while. Um, we have 20, 20 core members. And by that, I mean we have 20 people who are paid to work for Tor. Uh, in addition, we have a lot of volunteers. We have a lot of contacts in other organizations that we try to work with. Um, we also work with Transifex. I know they're here um, for translations as well. And so we develop Tor. We develop and maintain the Tor browser bundle. Anything related, any anything related to. Uh, just software using Tor in some way, we do. So how many know what Tor is? God, how many of you have used Tor? How many are running Tor as a relay or a bridge? You Come say hi later, I'll give you some stickers. Um, so Tor is a free software, it's open source. Um, and the goal is to help you defend against network surveillance. Um, to understand exactly how Tor helps you, it's kind of good to start with how the internet works. So this is the normal model without Tor, without a VPN, without anything. It's just you starting your laptop, visiting a website. In this case, you can browse whatever website you want, given that it's not blocked by your ISP but your ISP can see what you're doing. They can see which websites you're visiting. Any website you visit can also see the other sites you have visited based on your cookies. So these are some of the latest headlines for just normal internet browsing. Um, you have the issue where Twitter will, based on the sites that you visit, based on the blogs that you read, based on what you do on the internet, they will take that and analyze it and then suggest to you who to follow. 
Google already does this with ads. They take what you search for, what you have in your email inbox, who you email with, what kind of emails you get, what you view on YouTube as well. And they link all this together to serve you ads based on what they think that you will like. Amazon as well, when you visit the Amazon website, they show you items that they think that you will like based on what you've bought or based on what you've viewed. There's Google, there's Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Target figured out, a teen, figured out that a teenage girl was pregnant before her dad did just based on the items that she was buying and then all of a sudden she wasn't buying those items anymore. So if you want to be, I guess not anonymous, but more safer or you want access to content or you just think that you actually get anonymity, you can use a VPN. A VPN won't, uh, won't help with the cookie tracking issue with Google linking all of your searches and from YouTube and serving you ads and whatnot, but it will just give you access to content. It will give you a different IP address. But the problem that Tor helps with is still the same. Your ISP here can see that you're connecting to the VPN, but they won't necessarily see what you're doing. But whoever owns the VPN service can see you connecting and they can see what you're doing. So anyone doing any type of timing analysis here can see what you're doing. And it, that VPN turns out to log information and sell this or give it away or cooperate with law enforcement then they know what you're doing, they know who you are, they know what you did. So Tor tries to prevent this from happening by using layered encryption and multiple hops. So with a v VPN, you only have one hop between you and the website you want to visit. With Tor, you have three. And each hop knows as little about you and the data you're transmitting as possible. So the first connection from you to the first hop here, that, that relay, that hop will only know that someone is using Tor. It will know that you are using Tor. But it has absolutely no idea what you're doing, which websites you're visiting, which website you visited 10 minutes ago. It has no ID. So it passes that data on to the second hop. The second hop knows that it came from a first hop, and it has to pass it on to a third hop. It has no ID who it came from or where it's going to. The third hop knows it came from the second hop, and it also knows where it's going to, but it doesn't know who it came from, unless, of course, you're using Tor to log on to Facebook with your real name. That's kind of one of the challenges, is explaining to, to users exactly how Tor protects them, in the sense that you're not really anonymous if you're using Tor to log on to Facebook, but if you're using Tor just for access to content, then that's fine, it works. So the, the keys here, and also the name Tor, or the Onion Router, as it was called once, just come from the layered encryption. So when Tor starts up, when the client starts up, it will talk to each of the three hops, and it, they will agree on a short-term encryption key to use, a short-term key. So the data is wrapped first, is encrypted to the last hop, then you get another layer for the second hop, and a third layer for the first hop. And as you send your packet along, these relays will kind of peel off the layers of encryption. And that's how we have the onion routing. So I tried to find some, some headlines to kind of explain exactly what Tor helps with and what we do. Um, I did not specifically choose not to include any of the bad things. I just didn't find any headlines that would actually fit my slide. Um, we help journalists, so citizen journalists in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Syria, in Libya. They use Tor to get their, their stories, their pictures, 
their videos, in some cases, online and spread to, to media, to blogs, to Facebook. We help we help a lot of people. We help students. We help. There's a lot of people in Iran specifically using Tor just for access to content. If Twitter and Facebook is blocked, they use Tor just to access these pages. We help uh, the military use Tor. Law enforcement use Tor. It's okay. Party party in the UK. It's cool. We also help um, survivors of domestic abuse, for example, if they all of a sudden have to go to a shelter or, or they're at home and, but they can't use their PC because someone will actually come and look at what they've been browsing, then they can use Tor to figure out what they need to do in a safe manner. We also have a tool that's quite new where the goal is to map out all the censorship that is happening on the internet. So who's blocking Tor? How are they doing it? Who's blocking other websites? How are they doing it? And how can we get around that? That is one of the Python projects that I'm going to talk about later. I'm going to put my slides on, online later so the URLs, uh, you can get them. But we have around 13 Python projects. Some of them are no longer maintained. It doesn't necessarily mean that we don't want them to be. It's just that we don't have anyone right now who can take, take care of it. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of projects. Some of you may have heard about all of them. Who's heard about all of them? No one. That's good. So ARM is the anonymizing relay monitor. It's if you're, if you're familiar with, with Linux and you use top to so get the status and the processes and stuff, ARM will show you something similar, but just for Tor. So it will show you uh, non-sensitive connection details to other relays, uh, bandwidth, CPU, memory usage, the currently running config. And it is just very, very easy. If you're running Tor on a virtual private server and you can't have the GUI, but you want some stats anyways, this is a great tool to use. ARM is, uh, it actually started as a Google Summer Code project in 2009, and the developer has just kept on maintaining it, finding volunteers who want to work for it, and he's doing a fantastic job with this. Uniprobe is the tool I mentioned that we're working on. Um, to map out internet censorship. So the goal is that it will test your connection for, for blocks or anything being censored and try to learn as much about how that's being done as possible. So the goal is that you will download this, this tool and by installing it, you also allow us to run a set of tests so that we can collect this data and then we will hand it off to, uh, I know we're working with uh, MLab, Google's thing, um, to make more sense out of the data, uh, as well as the choke point project and a couple of other ones. Uh, with Uniprobe, so Uniprobe being a bit of a framework, there's a lot of tests that need to be written. We want to test for, does it have a captive portal? Like when you're using the hotel Wi-Fi before you can do anything, you kind of have to get this one page and you have to pay. So that, I guess, can qualify as a blocking, I guess, depends on who you ask. Um, so, there are, so we have some tests. Uh, there are more tests that we need to kind of identify exactly what we're looking for, exactly what we want to test, and then write it in Python. So we have three people working on it right now, and I'm sure they would love some help as well. STEM is the controller library for Tor. So we used to have Tor CTL. Um, that's still, still going, still being worked on somewhat, but STEM is kind of taking over these days. Um, it's 
it's useful if you want to do or write any type of code that is using Tor in some way. So ARM, the anonymizing VLA monitor, uses STEM to talk to the Tor process. Uh, Vidalia, the graphical interface that gives you the stop and start Tor button and the configuration and the message log and all these things, use STEM as well. The development wiki page for STEM is is great. It just lists a lot of kind of different tasks, um, more kind of projects, I guess, depending on how much you want to be involved and how well you know Python, um, how much time you have, and so on. So it's just really easy just to read the page, get involved, find bugs you want to help out with, um, and also talk to the developer as well. How many of you have heard about weather? Those of you who run VLAs, how many have heard about weather? One. Okay. I've been trying to figure out exactly how popular weather is. The so weather is a service. It's weather.torproject.org. It's a service that allows you to get notifications if your VLA is down. So if it's down, if... Uh, oh. I can't remember exactly what else it tests for. So it, it, will, it will let you know if it's, if it's been down for more than whatever you set it to. Uh, it will let you know when you get a free t-shirt. We give out tour t-shirts if you run a relay for long enough. Um, or if you help out in some other way, you also get a t-shirt. Um, the weather can be quite useful if you want to help out, but you don't really want to keep an eye on a server. That's fair enough. Get tour. How many have heard about that? How many have used it? Okay. So get tour is pretty useful for people in Iran and in China, where the tour project website is blocked. So this was set up when um, when, when when tour was first kind of made open source. I don't think anyone just even anticipated that it would be used by people in China and that it would be used by people in countries where there's strict internet censorship. So we have the website and we have this great tool and it seems to work and all of a sudden we get tons of emails from people in China saying they can't download our packages. So there's Get Tour. Uh, if you email, it was actually just, so it started as a uh, Naval Research Lab project, US government project, and then it turned into this uh, open source thing uh, and it was just this, you know, if you want to be anonymous online, you want to have a bit more kind of private life, you don't want websites to track you, you can use Tor. And then later on, we realized, hey, you can get around censorship as well. And that's, I guess, what you hear mostly about these days, is how it's being used in China and Iran and Egypt and all these other countries. Um, so if you email gettor at torproject.org and you just write Windows in the body, then it will send you the package. Uh, unfortunately, the I think the Linux and the OSX bundles are too big for Gmail and Hotmail to accept. Uh, so there's been a bit of like a challenge trying to get this to work, but also make it user friendly. Because if you start splitting the bundles, then I can imagine some users will have a problem putting it back together. Um, and then there's also some 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 extra features related to prevention of spam and uh, if you, I think you can, you can email the service like once a day or something, and if you email it too much, you're, you're blocked for a few days, uh, just so we can't just overflow our mail server. TorCheck. TorCheck, or check.torproject.org, is the first page you see when you start up the Tor browser bundle. It's the page that tells you whether or not you're using Tor, and uh, what your IP address is and some other info. This has been, I guess it's active since we're still using it, but it's, it hasn't been actively maintained for a while. But we are working on changing that, but if anyone wants to kind of jump on board and come and help us with it, that would be great, because I'd like to see this page be updated to something that looks a bit better and clarifies a couple of things that seem to be confusing for users. BridgeDB, so Tor Bridges. 
are non-public relays. So a bridge can be the first hop out of those three, and it can only be the first hop. Um, and they're private, they're not given out um, as, I guess, as publicly. So the idea was that bridges would be harder to block. We now know that China tends to just enumerate all of them anyways, and they pretty much successfully block Tor now. Um, but so BridgeDB is kind of the database, the back end that just holds all of these bridges in different pools depending on how we give them out. So there's a pool for, for web, there's a pool for email, social media like Twitter. Um, there's a private pool that we use and we give out for testing. Um, Coreflow is, so we have two projects that kind of go in, there in under the Torflow umbrella. It's the bandwidth scanner and SOAP, Snakes on a Tor, was a Google Summer Code project a couple of years ago. Um, one of the issues that, that we face is ex the exit relays and how people can just do whatever with them. A problem is people setting up exit relays and they sniff the traffic or they try to do something with DNS, or they just try to do something shady that they shouldn't be doing. So Snakes on a Tour will try to use the exit relays that exist in the network and figure out if they're actually doing anything, if they're using SSL sniff, or if they have open DNS set, or if they're, for some reason, blocking certain pages. Uh, so we try to identify those so that we can effectively ban them or bad exit them, as we say, um, so that clients can't use them um, and the people running them can't actually learn anything. The exit scanner is one of the easier projects to get involved with here because it doesn't necessarily require you to write any code, but you do need to run an exit relay. So an exit relay means that you allow people to visit any website they want through your home connection or whatever ISP you're on. Um, there are some things you can do to, to limit abuse in that sense. We do have a blog post explaining kind of what to expect and how you can run an exit relay but with like the minimum amount of harassment. So how to get involved, um, there's a couple of ways you can go about it. You can email us uh, or assistance is one of our lists if you don't want to make it public. If you want to make it public, there's Tor Talk and there's Tor Dev. There's also on IRC. How many are on, on IRC? How many are in the Tor channel? You should join. Come on. So the general approach is you, you, you read about the projects, you find a project you're interested in, you either email us or you can join the IRC channel, you can try to talk to the developer uh, who's responsible for the project, um, read up on the code and the documentation, just send us patches. Um, we just kind of ask where you can get, get started. Other ways to help would be to run a bridge or a relay uh, or an exit relay or, and encourage others to do the same. There's uh, torservers.net is an organization, nonprofit, based in Germany, I think, that will accept donations specifically to run relays. So if you want to help out but you can't really run a relay, then a donation is just as useful. Um, there's also organized hackathons, hackfests, meetups. Uh, learn about Tor and present at your university or your company or wherever. Or you can donate or help with QA testing, translation, support. There's, there's a lot of work that we need help with. Um, you don't need to know how to write code. You don't need to know how to write C code even to help out. Hackfest, Thursday and Friday. I know it clashes with the conference. We're really, really sorry. We have a developer meeting in Florence this week. 
um, and we try to have an open hackfest at the same time. So anyone who's interested, I think we're about like 30 or 40 people now for developers, volunteers. Um, so if you actually do want to get involved with the tour project and the help out with the work that we need to get done, um, Thursday and Friday would, would be a great time. Um, there's no kind of set start and end to this thing. You just kind of start at some point in the morning when you wake up and you want internet and coffee. I talk fast, apparently. So I have a lot of time for questions. If anyone has anything about Tor, anything and everything goes. <laughs> so you said something about running an exit node and preventing abuse. Yes. Um, would you like to go into depth about what that means? So when you set up an exit relay, you could specify the exit policy. So what kind would ports or services you want to allow and you don't want to allow. Uh, so we, we tried to come up with a list of, of ports that, would, that you should probably block. Um, email is blocked by default, for example. Uh, we added BitTorrent and a couple of other things. Um, so there's that. There is having a page so that if someone visits, like try to uh, visit the website for the, like the IP address, uh, they will get like a page saying this is a Tor exit relay. Um, there's contact your ISP, talk to your ISP so that they know what you're doing and they understand that you are running an exit relay, that they are okay with it, so that they just don't take it down. Um, and then if anything does happen, then let us know and we can, I don't know how much we can do to actually help you, but we'll, we'll put you in touch with, with people who can. That's kind of those. I, um, you said that uh, China are like blocking all the exit relays, or um, do you have any idea like how they're doing that, or how you're going to prevent it? Or so there's a lot of when it comes to blocking and blocking analysis. Um, the way you can block towards are a lot of different ways. You can block blocking the exit relays is a good start, or blocking the relays so that the client can't connect to the first hop. You can block the website so that they can't find the software. Um, that's why we've get tour so they can get it anyways. Um, when the tour client first starts up, it will contact uh, one of the eight directory authorities that we have. They're kind of like the main servers that decide uh, which relays should actually be allowed to be a part of the net, net network and which ones are actually bad. Uh, so you can block those. So if clients can't make that connection, um, then they can't connect. So that's why we have bridges. They can also download the same information from the bridges. What China started doing was that they blocked all of the relays. Then they started learning about the bridges. They started just visiting our website and sending us emails because we would just automatically re reply saying, here are three bridges you can use. So they would just do this and enumerate. They seem to have a lot of manpower there. Just enumerate all of them and just block them. And that was that. So for a long time, the only way to, to use or in China would be to get a new bridge. So what we did um, in February was we rolled in something called OBS proxy, or the OBS proxy Tor Braza bundle, which is a, um, the other term is pluggable transports. It takes the Tor traffic and just wraps it in like this other magic thing so that it doesn't look like Tor anymore. So it gets around the deep packet inspection boxes. If it doesn't look like Tor, then there's no reason to block it. Um, that works in China, it works in Iran, it works in Ethiopia and in Kazakhstan as well, where Tor is now being blocked with DPI. The only problem is that we currently have not been able to keep the bundles up to date. That's something we need to work on. So can we get around the censorship in China? Yeah, we are.
does IPv6 make things easier or harder for you or the guys trying to block you? IPv6 is not blocked in China. Um, I don't know if it's actually blocked anywhere, uh, but then the problem is that a lot of users don't know how to use IPv6. Um, but we do have IPv6 bridges. I think we have one or two. Uh, there's an email on Tor Dev for anyone who wants to help test IPv6 bridges. There's an email on the Tor Dev mailing list about how you can test which client you need um, and just how you can do it. Does that answer the question? Or did you mean it? Kind of, I was thinking in a, in a hypothetical world when, well, maybe not hypothetical, <laughs> uh, in a world where IPv6 is the majority protocol, mm -hmm. does Tor's job get easier because there are so few actual hosts to the number of addresses, or does it get harder? Or, I don't know. Not sure if I can answer that. You come to the Hackfest and ask. Good thing. Do you have any plans for extending the hidden service protocol to, to make it into a tamper-proof darknet with something like distributed storage? Hidden services. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, hidden services is a way to uh, host a website, for example, over Tor so that no one will know that you're hosting it and you will not know who's visiting it, only that they're using it over Tor. Um, if we're planning on extending it, how exactly? What would you want to do that you can't do? I'd like to have uh, distributed storage for such a site so if the initial server goes down, there are other backups to serve the same data signed cryptographically somehow. I think that Freenet does something goes, goes similar. If your connection goes down, you still yes. have to find a way to reach the internet, connect to Tor, and browse a Tor hidden service. Because these makeshift servers that uh, are actually our computers at home are not as reliable as a server in a proper location. It's true. Um, I don't know if there's anything that we can do with the protocol to make it happen, apart from just making Tor hidden services more stable in, in general. Or maybe can, misunderstanding the question here. Maybe we can distribute the storage, the, the static files that make up the site, distribute them over multiple uh, Tor users hmm? anonymously. Somehow they, they should not be able to tamper with the data, and the data should be available even if one or more or 99% of the new servers go down. Hmm. I don't think we've, we've thought about it. It's an, it's an, in, an interesting question. Um, no, um, I don't know. I don't think it's something that has been discussed. Uh, just a quick clarification. If I was running an exit server, uh, an exit relay, mm -hmm. um, and someone, say, came through me to a website like 4chan, would my ISP see me as visiting 4chan? Yes. Okay. So when I'm using Tor, if you have an exit relay and I use your exit relay, whatever I do, it will look like it came from you. Uh, okay. So with the problems with abuse, for example, there are uh, stories of people in Germany having the police on the door because their Tor exit relay has been involved in some, I guess, even, even not nicer sites than 4chan. Um, and that is, it is, it is a, a challenge. Uh, we are trying to figure out exactly how we can deal with it. We try to help these exit relay operators so that they uh, at least feel like they have someone to contact. Uh, we try to talk to law enforcement and we can confirm that, yes, this, this IP address was actually an exit relay between this time and that time. Um, So, yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, what, what do you say to the governments who say you're just making it easier for terrorists? Oh, um, 
Well, the U.S. government does fund us. It was a Naval Research Lab project to begin with. Uh, okay. Um, but what we say exactly, it is, it's kind of the same question as how do we feel about bad people using Tor to do bad things. Uh, and, of course, it's, it's terrible. I mean, I, I don't want people using Tor to, to browse child porn or to do any type of kind of terrorist activity. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want anyone not being able to browse the internet or to talk about the things that are happening in Egypt or people under abuse not to be able to find the information that they need so that they can go to a shelter. So there's, there are bad things on the internet and people will do bad things regardless of whether or not Tor exists. It just raises an interesting question. Should we trust you more or less because the US government sponsors you? Uh, um, Tor is not an intelligence honeypot. Um, I have to say that, it's true. Um, all of our code is, is open source. It's available online. Um, we have some very, very, very good people reading all of our commits. Any type of software we release, they have a look at, they test. If we were to just magically introduce a backdoor, someone would find it and call us out on it. And, we would have no funding. If we were to do anything bad with Tor, we would have a broken tool and no one would like us anymore. So this is kind of based on 10 years of doing really, really good work for a lot of people. So I guess you just either have to trust us or you can look at the code, you can try it out. Okay, so uh, th there are risks involved in running an exit relay. Are there any similar or are there any risks at all in running just a m middle relay? A normal relay. Um, when you, if, you, if you're looking at setting up a bridge, so the, like the private first hop or a middle relay, um, you would need to find an ISP that is okay with that. So we have this wiki page with like a list of good and bad ISPs. So whenever someone has successfully run a relay with some ISP for, for a while, they will up that, update that list so others can do the same. So you need to let your ISP know so that they're aware of it. But apart from that, then no. I mean, there's uh, the occasional, because your IP address will be available publicly on the internet, you might see a couple of more port scans. Um, but apart from that, there's, there's no risk of having the police knock down your door, no. Oh. Have, we, have there been many well, incidents of perhaps not police uh, banging on someone's door, but I don't know, Google accounts blocked and uh, uh, internet access revoked, things like that? Um, well, I had my, my server taken down. I was hosting a poor VLA, and it wasn't even using that, that much bandwidth, but apparently the ISP wasn't happy with it. I hadn't even checked and they just took it down. Uh, as for accounts being blocked, that's more if you're using Tor as a normal user. If you try to go to do anything with Google, you have to keep filling in these captchas. So Google don't like anonymous users very much. If you visit Facebook, um, it could just be because I'm, I keep using Facebook from different locations all over the place. I have to either give them my phone number so they can send me a text or identify photos. So in some cases, it, it's a bit tricky. Uh, it's a, it's a kind of a different user experience. But if you're just prepared for that and you know that that's, that's kind of a part of using Tor, then it works OK. So uh, if a malicious person set up an exit relay, what information can they do? They can, if you log on to Facebook without HTTP, they can get your username and your password. Any non-encrypted information you send over Tor can potentially be sniffed by the exit relay operator. Uh, 
Um, so the way we've kind of tried to, to combat this is with HTTPS Everywhere, the Firefox plugin that will, for a number of sites, rewrite the URL to include HTTPS. And we also just tried to push Google, Twitter, Facebook, they're actually rolling it out. They're at 30%. They're fixing their infrastructure um, to just enable HTTPS for older users by default. Yeah, there was a little problem for a while, I gather, that people were using BitTorrent over Tor. And so you were talking about trying to block that. How are you getting on with, you know, so apart from, you know, abuse being bad people using Tor for bad things, what about people just casually using it for you know, kind of selfish things rather than evil things, I guess. Um, we, for, for BitTorrent, we try to tell people that while you can technically use BitTorrent with Tor, it doesn't make you anonymous. There's something in the way of when your BitTorrent client connects to Tor and then connects to the tracker, you will anonymously send your real IP address to the tracker. And downloading a torrent over Tor when you've already given up your real IP address, it, I mean, it's, it's slow. I can't imagine anyone would want to do that. Um, then there was, what was the second part of your question? Was non-evil. Non um, a lot of people want Flash. A whole lot of people want Flash. And doing Flash securely is a pain in the ass. Um, a lot of people just want YouTube. Now that YouTube is mostly HTML5, it seems to work a bit better. Uh, but we do get a lot of emails from users who want Flash videos, Flash games, Break.com and YouTube are very popular. Um, and I think just if you're using Tor for streaming, if you're using Tor because you're in Europe and you want to watch something on Hulu, then buy a VPN maybe. I mean, if you don't need the anonymity, there are people who do. But we can't really censor them, we can't really block them. So we can just, I guess, encourage them not to use Tor that way. Um, if you'd like to uh, contribute by running an exit relay, would it be possible to run one that's firewalled to only allow access to, say, Twitter and YouTube, or would that be damaging to the project as a whole? It would, and it would be found by our scanner pretty quickly, and we would just take it out. Um, or we would actually contact you first. If you, if you set your contact info in the config, then we'll drop you an email and say, hey, why are you doing this? Can you just not do this and still run a relay? Um, but yeah, there are, there are people that have asked, you know, like, I want to set up an extra relay, but I do want to block porn. It's like we can't really censor our users. Like, who's, you know, like if I should decide what people in China can and cannot watch, that's I'd be kind of like China. So. You talked about your lists of uh, good ISPs and well, ones in favor of ones that that won't accept it. What's the length of, of those lists and? What do the majority of ISPs think of, of ha having an exit node going through them? What's the what the majority think? Mm -hmm. It seems to be like a mix. So like some are happy with just having a normal relay. When it comes to finding a uh, provider for exit relays, that's a bigger challenge. Because if you're just like a bridge or a normal relay, you just pass on encrypted traffic to somewhere else. So it's basically not your problem. If you're if you're setting up an exit relay, then it is your problem, what goes through your connection. Um, Tor servers, uh, Moritz um, is probably more qualified to answer this because he's the one that contacts a lot of ISPs, talks to them, says, you know, I got funding to set up all these servers, but I need to run exit relays. Um, and he's, he's in town if you want to talk to him on Thursday. Did we have a question over there? No? No. Okay. I think we are done. If there are no more questions, no more question one.
No more question two? <laughs> no more question three? <laughs> yeah, we have that. Thank you. Um, thank you again, and okay, this... Uh